I want to thank our residents. These are, of course, our professors and our team. Uh, and but our residents, uh, this is the, the first team, uh, and there was a second team when we discharged the patient. Thank you so much. Shukran, Dr. Suzanne, for the presentation. دي بتبين قد ايه الشغل مجرد ان هي حاله لكن الشغل اللي اتعمل فيها كم واحد كان داخل في الخطه بتاعه العلاج لغايه لما قررته وبعدين لسه الفولو اب لما البيبي يخرج فان شاء الله نبقى عارفين النتيجه بتاعته بعد كده يا سوزان العفو انا يشرفني طبعا ان انا اكون النهارده في في الكوكبه دي من ال العلماء <تصفيق> انا حاسه بحاله من النوستالجيا من ساعه اما جيت لان كل حد موجود في القاعه هنا من الاساتذه اللي احنا موجودين معاهم كان بيعبر عن ايه جزء منه اشتغل معاه واخذ ديسيجن معاه وتعلم منه وان شاء الله ان شاء الله ان الهدف من المؤتمر هو الكونتينيوس ميديكال ايديوكيشن ويستمر كمان سنوات وسنوات جايه انا يشرفني ان اقدم دكتوره ايمان رجب إيمان من الشخصيات الجميلة جدا اللي هي على علمه وعلى خلقه بتهتم بالحالات بتاعتها وعمرنا ما بنلجأ لها إلا ما بتكون معانا خطوة في خطوة في كل التفاصيل حتى وهي مسافرة بنبعت لها مسج وبترد علينا وبتتابع معانا الحالات ودي سمه للحقيقه لكل الناس اللي واحد اشتغل معاهم وده بيخلي الواحد يفيل يعني شوفوا دكتوره عزه وهي بتتكلم النهارده بتتكلم ازاي دكتوره نسرين وهي بتتكلم بتقول ايه دكتوره جليله بتتكلم ازاي سوزان بتتكلم ازاي دكتوره مها حسن بتتكلم ازاي فده بيخلي الواحد سكيور ان في ناس فاهمه هي بتعمل ايه ويلجا لها لما يكون محتاجها دكتورة إيمان هنتواصل معاها عبر ال... مش الأسير بقى عبر ال... يعني خلاص هي موجودة أهلا يا إيمان منورة الدنيا So my يعني I would like to start by thanking the neonatology team for the kind invitation to present our experience or the common neonatal abdominal tumors uh, I would like to uh, to give a special thanks to uh, Dr. Ma Hassan for, uh, for uh, yeah, insisting that we present the, the, the experience of Ain Shamsi in the neonatal tumors as well. Uh, as regular topic, uh, uh, the, the neonate presenting with abdominal mass, the common presentation, this is quoted from Nelson, uh, uh, the common masses are for, yeah, thought of as congenital anomalies, yet a differential diagnosis which needs to be considered is the neonatal tumors, although they are rare, yet we see them in practice uh, yeah, a couple of cases every year. Uh, so uh, in the neonatal period, uh, the, uh, the benign tumor, I will, I will mention in detail, but the benign tumor could be uh, uh, hepatic, could be uh, uh, mainly the hepatic uh, and renal, they can present with benign tumor, uh, yet neuroblastoma is predominant for the malignant in the, in the early uh, uh, presentation. Uh, during the infancy period, the uh, neuroblastoma, uh, hepatoblastoma and wellness comes. Uh, come to uh, to uh, in the uh, not frequent uh, but in the seen uh, tumors at this age. So uh, when we talk about an neonatal abdominal tumor, <clears throat> it's uh, we mention either hepatic, renal, and suprarenal or retroperitoneal tumor. In the hepatic lesions, uh, they are even either single hepatic focal lesion, multifocal, or um, diffuse uh, liver lesions. In the single lesion, the first probability we think of is congenital liver hemangioma, although the most famous is hepatoblastoma, but the most common is uh, liver hemangioma. Uh, there, uh, there is a, a benign tumor, which is a liver mesenchymal hamartoma. Uh, the hepatoblastoma comes after, afterwards, uh, the rhabdoids tumor and other liver sarcoma. In the multifocal, the predominant is infantile liver hemangioma, which is different from congenital, and I will mention later. In the diffuse, again, liver hemangioma is the predominant tumor for S neuroblastoma and the Down syndrome transient leukemia. Uh, 
this is the yeah I will uh, mention first the hepatic hemangiomata. Uh, the, this is the first uh, yeah, proper classification of liver hemangiomata done by uh, Emily Christian Lagay in 2007. She classified patients with liver masses into either focal. In the focal lesion, usually they are congenital hemangioma. Congenital hemangioma is different from uh, uh, infantile hemangioma that they do not go into growth phase. They are large, either they persist large or they, they, they regress spontaneously. And the kind of tumor in the liver, which are focal, they regress spontaneously. They are called rich or rapid involuting congenital hemangioma. So uh, they are, may be complicated at the presentation, but later on, they involute spontaneously after which the multifocal lesion and in those patients because this this uh, uh, publication was before the era of propranolol as primary treatment they were treated with uh, steroids uh, plus or minus embolization according to the complication of shunting of the vessels inside the liver then the diffuse liver hemangiometer, and they may be complicated by a, a consumptive hypothyroidism. And those, the photos of the focal lesion, multifocal and diffuse, and this, we have, I guess, like uh, nine or 10 patients with a diffuse liver hemangiomatosis, and they, all of them, except one before the era of propranolol, uh, were lost due to a refractory heart failure. Uh, this is the uh, when do we screen for hepatic hemangioma? It's not routine uh, uh, screening, but when, when we find more than five cutaneous liver hemangioma, we think of uh, exclusion of uh, uh, hepatic hemangiomata. So abdominal ultrasonography to classify the patient either focal, multifocal, or diffuse. And uh, this is the workup done for diffuse hemangioma. And this algorithm specifically was done by Dr. Ahmed Alam when he was a resident attending the vascular anomalies clinic. Uh, so uh, it's a multidisciplinary team, yes, uh, and the patient with diffuse hemangiometer, they are treated. Basically, they were treated in our center with, uh, we had some era of increased in frosteroids, and now the first line of treatment is propranolol. And I need to mention that we used to treat hypothyroidism, consumptive hypothyroidism in patients with diffuse liver hemangiometer, but nowadays we keep observation, close observation. Uh, we, we had like full treatment in the beginning and then the patients were complicated by heart failure because they are they are already in overload failure due to, uh, overload um, stress over on the heart because of the shunting then when we give uh, uh, l-troxin in those patients the patients usually they go into um, a symptomatic heart failure so uh, 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 the first era we used to give full dose uh, uh, L uh, uh, thyroid hormone and then afterwards we give uh, reduced dose in combination with the in collaboration with the, uh, the team in the endocrinology clinic. And recently we do not treat, we give propranolol and we, we put the patient on close observation and their uh, hypothyroidism, they are not, it's not manifested by any uh, neurocognitive uh, uh, delay and they are uh, spontaneously resolving within very short period of time. And uh, and we do not do liver transplantation anymore. We do not consider liver transplantation anymore in patients with diffuse hemangioma because of the response to propranolol. The congenital hemangioma, they are single lesion, uh, T2 hyper intense because of the large vessel, and we see large a focal large focal lesion, and spontaneously regressing and with large vessel. And the the problem of the congenital hemangioma is during due to shunting of the vessels, uh, arteriovenous shunting. So they may, be, may be complicated with heart failure. And those are the signal voids in the periphery of the lesion because they are large vessel and usually distal to the um, liver, the aorta is, uh, is becoming a small ca caliber because of the shunting. The diffuse liver hemangiomata, as we see in this, uh, in, the, in those photos, these are typical as we see in the patients. They are very large uh, lesion with uh, uh, a centripetal enhancing. You find the early enhancing in the arterial phase and delayed like an iris lesion uh, enhancement in the venous phase, giving like a rim enhancement. And they, they have massive hepatomegaly. The problem of uh, hypothyroidism is very well known due to um, secre of production of uh, iodine uh, iodothyronine deiodinase or deiodinase if for the ease of uh, spelling so the deiodinase uh, makes like a consumption of the thyroid hormone and those are the patients when they are treated the reg full regression of the lesion happens within a short period of time
Uh, those these are the workup and the complication in the congenital and the infantile hepatic hemangioma form. The congenital they are complicated by consumption coagulopathy, by high cardiac output failure, so close follow up of the heart condition. Uh, they are common, not commonly uh, um, complicated by uh, hypothyroidism, although the, the most common. Uh, um, complication of infantile, diffuse infantile liver hemangioma is hypothyroidism. They may be complicated with heart failure, yet like I mentioned before, uh, since the propranolol introduction, I guess we do not see symptomatic heart failure in those patients, yet they present with, in, um, with abdominal compartment syndrome. This is the problem. They came. They come. They usually come to the clinic in a, a respiratory distress because of the massive hepatomegaly. The second tumor is a malignant tumor, which is hepatoblastoma, and this is the case. Uh, yeah, and recently was admitted uh, in the uh, neonatal in neonatal ICU, and we had uh, several meetings about decision making in such uh, a patient. Uh, the imaging uh, reveals commonly a single. They may be multifocal, but commonly it's a single large lesion. Uh, the the one uh, above is from the literature. The second is one of our patients. Usually they come in a very large uh, uh, size. Uh, they have a contrast enhancement. They may be complicated by vascular involvement, and this is a major determinant for decision. And I'll mention later on, we have to seek from the radiology a full comment, and thank you, uh, Dr. Shaima Abdesattar, for, for, for her help in uh, yani, giving us a full comment about the vas vasculature involvement in patients with hepatoblastoma. So we do a combined MRI and MR angiography to delineate the vessels and uh, the remnant of the liver tissue because the, we classify uh, the involvement of the liver based on something called pretex. Pretex is pre-treatment extent of the disease, uh, denoting how many uh, segments are not involved by the tumor because the, the surgical decision is based on the remnant or remaining healthy non-involved uh, liver tissue. And usually in the classification, we mention uh, the, the vena cava and hepatic veins, the portal vein, the caudate lobe, and because the caudate surgery is quite tough one, and any extra hepatic involvement. So uh, in uh, after uh, many uh, hepatoblastoma treatment group, they were uh, gathered in uh, uh, like a childhood hepatoblastoma tumor international collaboration, and they classify the patient based on the pretext, the viper or the involvement of the vessels, the age of the patient and the alpha fetoprotein. Uh, and they have uh, classified the patient into very low risk, low risk, intermediate, and high risk. This based on uh, the, like I mentioned, the metastasis, the alpha fetoprotein, the viper, the involvement of the vessels, I mean, and the uh, uh, age of the patients. And uh, the patient who was admitted in the ICU, he had a non metastatic disease, like uh, the uh, uh, figure below, non metastatic disease less than eight years, alpha fetoprotein more than 100, and the VPER were negative, so the patient uh, well, was uh, uh, resectable, and uh, we had some concern about resection. That's why we gave him one cycle of chemotherapy, and then uh, the, the patient were either classified as very low uh, or low based on the pathology, which I will mention later, then the, the rest of the risk stratification based on the pretext or the pre treatment involvement of the tumor with the uh, age and the alpha fetoprotein. And uh, these are the pathological subtype of hepatoblastoma. The most good prognostic is the fetal uh, or the pure fetal. They denote different embryonic development of the liver. So the pure fetal is the most uh, the, the, the good prognostic one. The small cell undifferentiated is the worst prognosis. The mixed epithelial and embryonal and fetal, they are the most common subtype. In the hepatoblastoma, when they face a patient, we do proper staging and risk stratification with surgery consultation. If the surgeon uh, um, decision is not for to, to, uh, to go for uh, upfront surgery, the patient received new adjuvant because hepatoblastoma is chemosensitive, then the local control and then adjuvant chemotherapy. And uh, this one, uh, this publication is uh, an, quite an old one, but uh, they mentioned, uh, they gathered from the literature, lit literature the patient presented with congenital hemangioma, uh, congenital hepatoblastoma. Uh, there were 27 patients. Uh, 
in the most of them they have good prognosis except when the patient presented with abdominal compartment syndrome uh, so the, the the main line of treatment is surgery and chemotherapy most of the patient received chemotherapy mostly as new, a new adjuvant prior to surgery and then complete surgical resection, uh, resection. Uh, liver transplantation were done in two tumors but this is not commonly done in those patients because they go, they give good response to chemotherapy but the the problem of uh, a complication of the chemotherapy at this age is the, the one is one of concern. Uh, the second uh, uh, benign tumor in the liver is uh, mesenchymal hamartoma of the liver. They are large cystic lesion. They present early on, uh, but they are and multi like they like the photo on the right side. Large multi cystic lesion, hypo intense on T1, uh, and septated in the CT. Uh, and they have a hyper intense or sometimes with solid component on T2 weighted images, uh, like the, the the right side of the uh, slide. Uh, the other um, uh, malignant, apart from the hepatoblastoma, is the malignant rhabdoid tumor. It's not common. Uh, uh, the rhabdoid tumor category is a, a one uh, peculiar uh, for the infantile period. Uh, they may, may come as germline or as a, a new somatic mutation. The germline uh, is a mutation in smart b one which is a predisposition gene to, to develop rhabdoid tumor. The, the most famous is rhabdoid tumor of the kidney and the rhabdoid tumor of the brain. But sometimes malignant rhabdoid tumor of the liver happens. Uh, they, they present with abdominal enlargement. The characteristic uh, uh, um, histopathological or immunohistochemical uh, uh, pattern for rhabdoid tumor is the negative stain for smark b1 or the, the mar this marker is called INI1. INI1 is the marker which is lost for rhabdoid. It's diagnostic for the rhabdoid tumor. The alpha fetoprotein for rhabdoid is normal. As this is differentiating from the hepatoblastoma and the outcome of the malignant rhabdoid tumor deliver is very poor, although they, are, they receive uh, uh, multi-agent chemotherapy including anthracyclines and they receive uh, a surgical resection yet uh, the prognosis is still guarded. So those are the commonly seen uh, uh, hepatic tumors, uh, either hepatic hemangioma uh, or mesenchymal hamartoma, hepatoblastoma, other liver uh, sarcomas, uh, they are not commonly seen in the infantile period and I will mention uh, yani, like, yani, the, the most common uh, infantile, uh, infantile sarcoma at the end. The hepatic lesion, the commonest is hepatic vascular lesion or hepatic hemangiomata. The mesenchymal hamartoma comes next and then the hepatoblastoma in the frequency uh, in the first two months of life. Uh, the second tumor with diffuse involvement of the liver is the neuroblastoma, which is the 4S or special site. The 4S neuroblastoma, they present with localized primary tumor. So you find a small suprarenal gland, like stage 1 or, or two, uh, 2A, and then they get, give the metastasis to the skin, with like this picture, diffuse subcutaneous nodule, which is not colored, not similar to the either leukemia cutis and not similar to the... Um, the uh, blue rubber, uh, blue uh, berry, um, blue rubber, uh, uh, <laughs> blueberry muffin. Uh, they are not similar. They are not discolored like the, the like the blueberry muffin. Uh, they are subcutaneous nodule, and the bone marrow may be involved with uh, up to, uh, but less than ten percent. And they present in the first twelve months of life. The prognosis is very good. They present with a very large lesion. Those those are uh, uh, diffuse lesions, and those are after treatment. You feel you find the the yani, uh, marked uh, response. They may if they are not symptomatic, they may be left without treatment if they have low risk by risk stratification. Those are the, the characteristic huge hepatomegaly with multiple uh, involvement of the liver. They give similar picture to the uh, infantile hemangioma, yet usually we seek for uh, the patient with diffuse lymphoma hemangioma for any primary, <clears throat> sorry, chest or abdominal. Uh, and the prognosis is very good. They may be complicated with abdominal compartment syndrome.
uh, and those are one of the autopsy in, in one of the fetuses they have found a diffuse liver in uh, involvement the four, this one of our patient with the 4s neuroblastoma he presents or she presented with uh, um, a huge hepatomegaly uh, she did not have a marked respiratory distress uh, although the liver was very huge she had mild respiratory distress and uh, uh, yeah, the, the father uh, because the child was uh, very good he, he declined uh, any medical treatment and the child uh, improved spontaneously so they are if they are not symptomatic they may be conservatively uh, uh, managed you find the huge uh, hepatomegaly this or the liver uh, with diffuse uh, uh, masses multiple masses uh, they they may miss, as, like I mentioned before, they may, may mimic the infantile hemangioma, the diffuse liver hemangioma, uh, and this one of the case reports uh, uh, published in 2020 uh, about uh, one of the patients who had skin hemangioma, and they found that they have liver, diffuse liver lesions, so they thought of diffuse liver hemangiomatosis, and they found out that he had, she had the primary inside the paraspinal uh, thoracic primary, so the patient was 4S neuroblastoma. And the 4S neuroblastoma, they are treated according to the regular risk stratification. So the patient usually they present, or it's, the, it's peculiar for the first year of life, but commonly they have they have they have anemic non -amplifi amplification, and commonly they are treated with a low risk uh, protocol, which is mainly expectant treatment. They may receive chemotherapy if symptomatic. The main symptomatology is abdominal compartment syndrome. Another diffuse liver lesion in patients with fetal hepatomegaly is the transient leukemia. And our uh, last year uh, presentation was about in the in the neonatology uh, conference was about the transient leukemia Down syndrome. So this uh, in, in Down syndrome, when if we found a huge hepatomegaly early life, if the patient does not have heart failure, we have to think of transient leukemia. The transient leukemia gives a diffuse liver uh, enlargement, huge hepatomegaly with decompensation uh, because of the disturbance in the fetal hematopoiesis in the hepatic fetal hematopoiesis uh, so it's they present early life in during the neonatal period the abdominal neuroblastoma is far, by far the commonest most of them they are, are incidentaloma they are accidentally discovered during uh, screening uh, but uh, um, they may present with advanced stage uh, the survival analysis since long time for the congenital uh, neuroblastoma it goes from 85 and, uh, and above because usually they present with uh, a, a good prognostic criteria yet the problem as as the other uh, neonatal tumor the abdominal compartment syndrome. The renal masses, renal masses uh, in, in, in non-congenital anomaly, we may think of Wilms tumor, which is commonest but above the age of two months. Uh, uh, so the first year of life, the commonest is congenital mesoblastic nephroma. Uh, the the uh, malignant counterpart is Wilms tumor, malignant rhabdoid, like I mentioned of, you know, in the liver. There is the most famous is the renal rhabdoid and the clear cell sarcoma of the kidney. When we find bilateral renal enlargement, it's either Wilms tumor or or nephroblastomatosis. The congenital uh, mesoblastic nephroma. <clears throat> Congenital mesoblastic nephroma uh, is uh, usually a large lesion with effacement or uh, encroachment upon the renal parenchyma. Uh, they may be cystic or solid. Uh, they have two subtypes, either classic subtype, uh, which is very good prognostic and mainly benign, or the cellular subtype. The cellular subtype carries a specific mutation called ATV6 uh, and TRAC3, which is a mutation common, uh, shared by the cellular subtype type of congenital mesoblastic nephroma and the infantile uh, fibrosarcoma and they both happen during the neonatal period. Uh, the the uh, um, age of uh, median age is uh, 3.4 months so they present early life uh, and they never almost never occur after the age of two years and they usually they present by early stage and the prognosis is very good in the congenital mesoblastic nephroma. Uh, the nephroblastomatosis is thought of when you find bilateral renal enlargement. So uh, what's nephroblastomatosis? They are nephrogenic crest, 
What are nephrogenic rest is the rest from the early embryonic life with the development of the kidney, uh, uh, the remnant of the metanephric blastema, which is a mesodermal origin of the kidney. When the metanef uh, metanephric blastema, which the one forming the glomeruli in, in neutral life, when they have rest, they have two types of rest, either intralobal rest inside the kidney itself or perilobar around the kidney lobule or loop. Uh, the nephrogenic rest uh, happens in, in, in almost in the frequency of 30-40% of Wilms tumor and in bilateral Wilms tumor they are found in 99%. Uh, like I mentioned, either perilobar around the, the renal uh, lobule or intralobar, uh, the perilobar uh, is uh, worse prognosis uh, they they have hyperplasia they are formed mainly of blastema which is the uh, early developed uh, developmental phase of the kidney and uh, uh, less stroma on the other way uh, around the intralobar they are mainly stromal and these are the picture of nephroblastomatosis which is different from the kidney uh, wilmes tumor the kidney the wilmes is a focal lesion here we find like nephromegaly and the kidney tissue you find the the whitish uh, uh, medial tissue uh, med uh, they, they are the kidney tissue so it's like a rind or uh, belt around the kidney and non-enhancing they are uh, peculiar in the uh, in the um, CT and MR uh, they have low intensity in MRI and low density in CT and they are poor enhancement lesion because they have do not have uh, uh, and they are not uh, already turned malignant, but they are predisposed to malignant. That's why uh, the the approach of bilateral nephroblastomatosis, the subtype of nephroblastomatosis, which is predisposing to malignancy, which is the perilobar hyperplastic, they are treated according to two schools, uh, the COG or children the oncology group, or the SIUP, uh, uh, which is the uh, uh, International Society of Pediatric Oncology. Both of them use upfront treatment with chemotherapy chemotherapy, uh, venipressin, uh, uh, actinomycin D. And then the patient were observed. The duration of treatment is very variable. Uh, in the COG, they are treating with 24 uh, uh, weeks of chemotherapy only. And decision making if the patient is progressing for partial nephrectomy, uh, because it's usually bilateral lesions. Uh, and the SIO protocol, they, they give chemotherapy in if the patient develop any nodular lesion or a progress of the lesion uh, so the, the approach it will be a surgical approach and the duration of treatment of medical treatment or chemotherapy is reaching to two years with spacing of the frequency of the vincrescent cosmogen this is the surgical approach if the patient develops nodular lesion because they they are known to to have predisposition to develop a malignant tumor and the Wilmes tumor uh, usually in the neonatal period or the early life, uh, first year of life, they are usually uh, uh, treated with conservative, if conservative, I mean no chemotherapy, no radiotherapy, if the lesion is small, so any uh, doubtful lesion, small lesion should be approached at this part time. If it is Wilmes tumor or partial nephrectomy can be done or, tot or nephrectomy, total nephrectomy if the mass is large, but this, uh, the mass is less than five, five and, uh, f 550 grams, they are may, may be managed without chemo and without radiotherapy. Uh, coming to the retroperitoneal lesion, they may be lymphatic lesions, and uh, the lymphatic lesion I mentioned because they, they we are commonly seeing, uh, now not commonly, but we are seeing in the last uh, couple of years some retroperitoneal lesion coming in the infantile and neonatal period, which are lymphatic malformations. Lymphatic malformation, uh, now there is a, a, a subgroup of lymphatic malformation, which are complex lymphatic malformation, which are aggressive and they necessitate medical treatment. The germ cell tumor and the infantile sarcoma. The germ cell tumor are uh, originate from a totipotent uh, stem uh, germ cell and the, the one which is supposed to form the fetus or the gametes and the fetus. So uh, they, uh, they have a somatic differentiation and um, somatic mutations. So if they, the, the tumor originate from the cell uh, which uh, are to be, uh, which are allocated to form the fetus, so they are called teratoma, either immature or mature teratoma. 
And if they are uh, uh, allocated to form the membrane of the fetus, uh, chorion and amnion, so they develop carcinoma or yolk sac tumor, which are the malignant subtype. And uh, the embryonal carcinoma, another subtype, if they are very premature, they form uh, seminoma or dysgerminoma, yet they uh, usually it does not happen inside the, uh, uh, in the context of the neonatal uh, uh, period. Uh, I would just uh, to, to emphasize that alpha fetoprotein interpretation in the period, in the neonatal period, uh, it's different from the adult because we cannot, uh, uh, yeah, we have to, to, do, to, to put it in the proper age specific alpha fetoprotein uh, uh, normal range for not to uh, uh, like stigmatize the patient with malignant tumor and they are not. The predominant germ cell tumor uh, is uh, in the retroperitoneal area is the sacrococcygeal teratoma. The sacrococcygeal teratoma may be mature in 51% and immature in 49%. Yolk sac tumor is the second uh, common uh, uh, malignant tumor, and usually the yolk sac happens in the type 4, which are there is no external component, uh, mainly internal component for the sacrococcygeal teratoma. Uh, the the uh, uh, neonatal germ cell cell tumor the, in the sacrococcygeal area, they are treated basically surgical. Uh, if, the, the, if there is uh, um, not, no complete uh, excision or the surgeon uh, deem and, uh, yeah, that the tumor is not to totally excised, the patient would be managed by biopsy, neoadjuvant chemotherapy because they are very chemosensitive tumor, especially the yolk sac component, and they are a yeah, good prognostic tumor. And not to forget that the, the advanced teratoma may be fetus in fetus syndrome, which is present with like another bone and another fetus in fetus, which is not common, but they have some, there is some publication in the literature about this. Coming to the retroperitoneal lymphatic malformation, they are cystic lesion. We found them in the uh, behind the, the, the gut. <laughs> they are multilocular cystic lesion, not, not calcified. Uh, there is no contrast enhancement. They are T2 hyperintense, denoting a cystic component. Uh, the retroperitoneal lymphatic malformation. If they if they are surgically excised, they are sur yeah, they are uh, they are to be excised. That yet if they are not sur sur amenable to, sec to surgical excision, uh, uh, they are treated uh, either by intra-lesional uh, uh, sclerotherapy or medical treatment with serolimus, and they, uh, we have very good experience with treatment of lymphatic malformation with serolimus. Uh, coming to the end, the infantile sarcoma, I, I did not mention a lot because most of them present with peripheral, not abdominal tumor. The predominant peripheral tumor, the, the infantile fibrosarcoma, they may happen intra-abdominal, but they are commonly uh, peripheral. I do not uh, want to put uh, our experience next presentation, by inshallah. Uh, infantile fibrosarcoma and primary myxoid uh, uh, mesenchymal tumor of infancy. We have uh, actually a nice publication, and I would like to thank uh, Dr. Amr, uh, Abdul Hamid Abu Zaid uh, for his uh, يعني, uh, insisting for us to report our experience uh, in the congenital hemangioma discrepancy with the caposiform hemangioendothelioma and congenital fibrosarcoma and it's public, uh, published in the European uh, Journal of Pediatric. Uh, to sum up, many tumors are encountered in the neonatal period. They have peculiar presentation. Most of them have good prognosis. There are different approaches uh, from the pediatric tumor. The collaborative approach is crucial uh, for good outcome. And coming to the end, I would like to thank the neonatology team with my mentor, Dr. Hisham Awad. Yani, yani, he knows very well how yani, I appreciate and I took advice from him in every single uh, problem we are facing in practice. Uh, uh, in, in life in general, yeah. uh, and I would like to thank uh, the uh, uh, pediatric surgery team, special thanks to Dr. Usama Nagar, Dr. Amr uh, Abdul Hamid, and Dr. Uh, Ayman um, Alim for their collaboration with the pediatric oncology team. I would like to thank the radiology and the pathology team. A big thanks to my team and uh, missing the place, and I would like to see yeah, missing you all, and I will I hope to meet you soon, inshallah. شكرا جزيلا الدكتوره ايمان الدكتوره ايمان دايما بتبهرنا بال بال بالعلم وبالاخلاق وبكل حاجه جميله وبالاهتمام بالعيان ويتس يعني 
elaborate uh, uh, um, lecture on the tumors that can be in the wire in the neonates. It's, very, it's a very interesting uh, uh, lecture. بعد كده وللأسف ما عندناش بقى فرصة للكلام مع إيمان فحننطلق للدكتور هاني عماد